Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! You know, Ronnie's playing multiple bands until the band Elf, right? I guess. Uh, or actually, mm -hmm. at what point do you actually, is it the Electric Elves that you go into it? No, no. Um, back back in the day, Ronnie, well, you know, Ronnie's earlier bands were like Ronnie and the Red Caps, yes, you yes, know, yes, yes, and yes. Ronnie and the Rumblers. And so he wasn't many. even the singer. He wasn't even the singer in the original bands. He just played bass. And there, was, there was a singer in the first band. And then all of a sudden, hey, I can sing, you know. <laughs> He's got, yeah. Boy, and boy, could he really sing. But anyways, um, he had a band. There was a band called Ronnie Deal and the Prophets um, that was like, you know, the, the club band. And at the time, I was in a band called the Sindels, which I played drums. I was a drummer in the band. And my best friend uh, was a guitar player. And I think, you know, we started this thing when we were in high school. So we were like, you know, 15, 16 years old. And... Um, but Ronnie's band was like the band, you know, it was the best band around. And, and they were doing, you know, it was like back in the day when you did four sets in a bar, you know, and all cover material. And, but Ronnie, Ronnie's band was doing, you know, things like Delilah, you know, Tom Jones, um, you know, all these big vocal songs like that nobody else could do, you know, uh, all the top 40 songs, you know. And uh, and that's what made you know his band like the best club band around. So one night, um, one night they were playing at this bar in Cortland, it's a small place, and it was like on a weekday night, like a Wednesday night. I went down to hear the band, and you know they took a break. You know Ronnie came over to talk, and he goes, you know, we were talking. And he goes, hey, but you know, he said, you know how to play guitar, don't you? Because he knew I was a drummer, and I had sat in with. I had sat in with his band, Ronnie Dion the Prophets, before on drums. So he knew I was I was a capable drummer. And he said, you can play guitar, can't you? And I said, yeah, I can play guitar. Well, I knew like three chords on the <laughs> guitar that my friend, you know, the, in the band I was in, taught me, you know, because we used to sit around and he'd show me how to play. I said, yeah, I can play guitar. Why? And he goes, well, our rhythm, our rhythm guitar player is going to be leaving the band. And he said, and if you... If you want to, you know, be in the band, I'd like to have you be in as the rhythm guitar player. And I said, no, I'd love to. And at the same time, the drummer, Gary Driscoll, was going for his draft physical. And he said, if Gary fails his physical, we're going to need a drummer and a guitar player. And he said, you have your choice. You could come in the band as a drummer, because he knew how he, how he drummed. Mm -hmm. and, and you could, Or you could come in as a guitar player, you know, whatever choice. So, anyways... Long story short, Gary failed his physical, and I was happy about that because I didn't. I wanted to go in as the guitar player, you know. <laughs> okay. And um, so over a period of a couple of months, you know, like I was only the rhythm guitar player, so all I had to do was learn chords to the songs and play them. And being a drummer, you know, it was great, great for me because you know a rhythm guitar player. I think, and I always thought through the years that a lot of these kids, when they learn to play guitar. You know, they're learning like Eddie Van Halen leads, you know, and Randy Rhodes and all these crazy scales and stuff. But, you know, I think it's more important to learn as a rhythm player first, you know, play the chords, play the rhythms, you know, then then go to the leads. But anyways, I was a rhythm player. And uh, so I joined that band when it was Ronnie Deal and the Prophets and we were a club band. And we had the the lead player, you know, which the leads back then were pretty simple because they were all cover songs, you know, and. So we had uh, Ronnie on bass and vocals. We had the lead player. I played rhythm and Gary on drums. And we were a club band that played, you know, four sets a night in all these like, clubs, you know. Like the Tri-State area? Every, yeah, everywhere we could. All the colleges, you know. There was a lot of work back then for bands, you know. We traveled around Connecticut, you know, Massachusetts, you know, up the upper northeast, you know, in Canada once in a while. And so, you know, we did that, and then... We figured, let's. We need another person in the band. We need a keyboard player. That, so we knew this guy Doug Thaler, who was, you know, went to college here, and he ended up being Motley Crue's manager. But he came in. At, we got Doug in the band as a keyboard player. That he couldn't play keyboards. Mm -hmm. He was like a two-finger keyboard player, but he could play guitar too. But we felt that he was. We needed his vocal backing voice, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, he did write some songs. So we we got him in the band. And then we had this, uh, we were playing in uh, Connecticut. We had a week-long uh, job there at this club, and we decided to 
drive home the night after the last show, and we got in a car accident, and we were all in the van, and this drunk driver ran into us, and um, the lead guitar player was driving our van. He got killed. Yeah. Ronnie and I ended up in the hospital in Winstead, Connecticut, next to one another. We looked like zombies. I had a broken leg. He, Ronnie, Ronnie's whole scalp got torn back. He had over 100 stitches in his scalp. Um, you know, it was a bit really bad. Doug Thaler's leg got crushed. He had permanent disability, you know. All our equipment was ruined, trashed. You know, the van was trashed. You know, and, and Ronnie and I woke up in a hospital bed next to one another, and and um, we found out Nikki, you know, had, the guitar player had died. You know, and we just started crying, and, you know, it, it, we just figured, you know, Ronnie had looked over and, you know, we said to each other, are we going to put this back together? And we said, yeah, we are. We're going to put it back together, you know. And from that point on, you know, we, we were in the hospital a week, and then we went back home to Cortland, and, uh, you know, it took months for us to recuperate. I had a cast on and Ronnie. We, I mean, we looked like zombies because we were so black and blue on our faces and everything. And Ronnie, you know, his head was shaved and he had all these stitches, like a hundred and some stitches through his head. But we put the band back together. And at this point in time, I was the only guitar player. So it was me, Ronnie, on bass, um, we got this guy named Mickey Lee, who was a keyboard player that we knew, and Gary was the drummer. And we started this, uh, and actually, when Doug got out of the hospital, we brought him back in on, on rhythm guitar. And um, Doug was only, and that, that was the beginning of what was called the Electric Elves. Okay. And, um, and that went on for a while. Doug was only in the band a short time. His taste in music was just different. You know, it was like, for us, it was like Led Zeppelin and The Who and, you know, and all that uh, British uh, hard rock that was coming in. And that's what we wanted to play, you know, the small faces and, and stuff like that. And Doug Doug was more of like um, the Bee Gees, you know, he liked smoother rock, you know, and it just didn't me mesh, you know. So he ends up, you know, leaving the band and, um, and, and went on to have a good career, you know, of his own. But... So after that, we became the elves, and the elves played, and, and the thing is with the elves, we became like the most popular band around because when the new Beatles album came out, we learned the whole album, and we'd play it live. Wow. When the new Stones album came out, <laughs> we'd learn the whole album, you know, and play it live, and we'd do, the, we'd do them as medleys, you know, the songs, and so we became very, very popular because of that. And the reason why we could do that was because of Ronnie's voice. You know, Ronnie was capable of singing anything and singing it really well. So we did that, you know, for a while. Then we had, um, you know, we started, you know, working on original material and, um, and, and I, you know, I wrote some songs myself. We wrote a couple of songs like, uh, collectively at rehearsal, I think Mickey Lee and Ronnie wrote this. I'm talking about the first Elf album. Yep. And um, we had an audition set up in New York uh, with Clive Davis, who then was um, president of Columbia, I think it was. And Roger Glover and Ian Pace from Deep Purple were in town, and they were looking to produce a band. So they came to the audition. We were just in a rehearsal hall in New York City. It was like um, Clive Davis and a couple of his execs and uh, Roger and Ian were there and we we just set up and we played like four or five songs of our original songs yeah. and we found out the next day that we were getting signed to the label and that roger and Ian were going to produce us wow it just, and, it's strange how it happened so we, quickly yeah and then um we ended up going to atlanta georgia to record the the, the, the alpha album the first album in a studio called studio one which then was a pretty famous studio because it was i forget there was a fairly well-known band that kind of ran that studio but anyways we recorded that there and that's when we became elf when that album came out okay. and um you know ronnie and i did all the all the photographs for that album you know because i said you know we have now one of us has to dress up like an elf you know <laughs> and we have to make one of us make up like an elf you know we had those crazy ideas and um but at the time photography was my hobby so i knew a lot about you know i developed my own pictures i, I had a lot of cameras and stuff so I said, I'm going to take the picture, and we're going to dress you up like, you know, we're going to make you up like the elf. And we went to Syracuse and bought, uh, went to Syracuse stage, and we bought, like, um, 
face putty and your makeup and all the stuff, you know. And we came back and we made these ears, these cardboard ears we put on Ronnie's ears with makeup <laughs> and made a pointed nose and sprayed him up, sprayed his hair with this white it's, stuff. It's like, it's like right yeah. out of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and so we went out riding that day. I remember it was a real hot summer day, and we were driving around, and we went out to the country, and and, um, and I just took a ton of pictures because originally the album was supposed to be a fold-out, you know, like a double-type album, a fold-out album with a lot of pictures. So we had uh, the one they used for the cover. That was definitely going to be there, but we had another one that was uh, we took some in the woods where I had Ronnie take all his clothes off, you know, <laughs> And he was in the in the in the shadows of the woods, you know. And there were some great photographs, but the but the label never used them. Do you still and, have um, it? It was, huh? Do you still have those pictures? Not that I want to see nudes. I'm just you saying. know, I I did find I did find some old black and white negatives, you know. But um, I think they they probably because of age, you know, and being film, um, they weren't that good anymore. But uh, yeah, there were some great photos that we sent. We, you know, we sent them all to the label, you know, because it was going to be a double album, and um, and they decided, okay, it's not going to be a double album. So all they used was the face shot, and the back of the album was a, was a, was out in the country with a superimposed picture of the group over it. Wow. So we were kind of bummed out because we you know took some great pictures out in the boonies, you know, and um, you can see that one little picture on the back of the album, Ronnie's got no clothes on he's off to the side in the side of the woods but we took some great ones and that was that was the elf band you know the, the, and then the, so so the cover is ronnie i never was sure if it was ronnie or not or super yeah ronnie. yeah no it was, it was because um yeah i mean back in those days i mean they used to people used to mistake ronnie for me and vice versa you know because yeah, we were yeah. basically the same height you know we had the same lousy hair um you know <laughs> and um we look like bookends you know <laughs> but uh you, but yeah, so people would say, "Is that you on the cover? Or is that Ronnie?" I said, "Nah, that's you, Ronnie." I said, uh, "Just look at the picture on the back." I said, "I got better legs than yeah, that." You know. <laughs> do you have Do you have any but, unreleased jam sessions or unreleased material from the Elf years of you and Ronnie jamming? Oh, there's there probably is. I mean, you know, back then there was there was just tape. You know, you had a t cassette recorder. You know, it wasn't like today where you can record anything on your phone in an instant. So. There probably there probably is somewhere. I got a ton of cassette tapes, you know, whether they're any good or not, because, you know, tape deteriorates over years. Yeah. You know, it doesn't it doesn't last. You know, and, and um, so I don't I don't know. I, I there might be, but who knows? If I if there was, they probably wouldn't play anyways. So the, so so you get your big break. You're opening up for Purple now, right? Yeah. So when that album came out, you know, because two of the guys in Purple you know, produced it, we were on tour with Purple. And Purple at the time was probably the biggest band in the world. I mean, we were playing arenas. They weren't theaters. They were arenas. They were huge places and, and, and outside shows too, you know. So we got to play, you know, we went from like a club band to playing like, you know, you know, arenas with Deep Purple. You know, well, we did our share of like, you know, theater shows with like you know we did you know some shows with your eye heap and stuff like that but you know with deep purple it was arenas you know and those were great great times you know with um with, with richie blackmore and all the, uh, the original lineup of deep purple wow. what did you think of richie blackmore back then as a person i mean i know he, he everybody says he's difficult right i mean was he difficult did well he seem difficult? you know the thing is, like, yeah, I heard we heard all these horror stories, you know, that, that you know Richie was, you know, had thrown, he threw groups off the opening acts off the tour because he didn't like somebody in the band or he didn't like yeah, the guitar, exactly. you know, whatever, you know. We heard all these horror stories, you know. And the thing is, like, Richie was one of my idols, you know. I mean, I idolized him. It was like him, Jeff Beck, you know, Jimmy Page, all those guys back, you know, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy Hendrix, you know, all those guys in that era of time, you know. That's why I idolized. That's who. That's what. Was, those guys were my inspiration, you know, that's how I learned, you know, I'm not a great guitar player, but what I can play is what I learned, you know, and, and was inspired by those players. So, you know, I was like, to go on tour with a band that I idolized and a guitar player that was my idol, you know, I didn't know what, what it was going to be like, you know, but I remember the first date of the very first tour, you know, and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, on the stage, and the, the crew is setting up the equipment and stuff like that. And I thought I wanted to meet Richie, you know, because yeah, those course. guys, 
those, those guys back then, they had they all had their own dressing rooms, you know. Richie had his, and those guys really didn't hang out together at all. You know, they they uh, Roger and Ian did, you know, but you never even saw Ian Gillen until it was time for them to go on stage. You know, he was on stage, he played the set, and then he disappeared again. So it was it was weird, you know. So I asked one of the crew. I said, um, "Where's Richie's dressing room? You know, I want, I want to meet him." They go, "Oh no, no, you can't, you can't do that. You know, you can't bother him. You know, can't do that." And I said, "Come on, where is it?" So I found out where it was, you know. And I walked down the hall, and I and I see his name on the outside of the door, and I knock on the door, right. So he answers the door, and I and I look in, and I can see like you know candles burning and all that stuff. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and yeah, you know. So I I said uh, I introduced myself, you know, to him, and you know I didn't walk in the room. I was standing outside, and he just opened the door, and I introduced myself, and uh, he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay." And um, I said, "Well, I just wanted to ask you like one question," and he said, "Well, what's that?" And I said, "I want to know like who your favorite guitar player is." And he said, well, my favorite guitar player is Jeff Beck. And I said, well, you know what? My favorite guitar player is Jeff Beck also. I said, but you're my you're my second favorite guitar player. And, you know, I mean, we hit it off fine. But I think that even even if I hadn't done that, we still would have hit it off. You know, the band would have hit it off fine with him because, you know, we were easy to get along with. You know, we weren't going to cause any problems or anything like that. So, I mean, every night. I would stay on the side of the stage, you know, where he played, and I would watch him play every night, wow. you know, like usually, usually when an opening act sees the the headliners, you know, they don't stick around, you know, doing their own thing. But I stayed every night. I watched him play, and uh, he, sometimes he would hand me hand me his guitar, you know, and I would go tune it for him, and I bring it back, and um, so it was like a very magical very times, cool thing. magical times, you know? and. Um, you know, he would break a guitar every night. You know, he'd he'd break a static Stratocaster every night, smash it. It was part of the show. Yeah. You know, and he'd, he he when he was getting ready to do that, he'd look over at me and he'd go, "This is for you." <laughs> you know, and then he then he'd like smash this guitar. You know, so it was just so, such a cool time. It was yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. All right, you so know? so then you exit Elf, right? You mm-hmm. exit, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you exited, why you exited, but I just you know quickly on that. Well, you know, I I, ended, I I left the band. There was a lot of personal. It had nothing to do with you know bad vibes with any of the guys in the band or anything like that. I just needed to like I felt at the time, and this is what I can remember that I hadn't done anything in my life except be in a band. You know, from junior high into high school, that's all I did was you know I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to play in a rock band. You know, and it got to a point where you know I was on stage you know, all these different places. And I wanted to experience what the audience was experiencing. You know, I wanted to be them. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I was always the guy on stage and I just wanted to do some different things in my life. You know, I wanted to have some different experiences that I never did before. I never had an eight hour a day job, you know, in my life, other than even though being a musician is a 24 hour a day job. So I left the band not under good, you know, not with any kind of bad terms or anything like that. And I never, and I never really thought it would be forever. I thought it would only be for a short time, you know. And but the the, the circumstances that were evolved from there, um, you know, with with Rainbow and Sabbath and all that. I mean, eventually those things would have happened anyways, you know, whether I had left the band or not, mm-hmm. you know, and. and and that's just a normal thing for Ronnie's career to take off. So, you know, there was never there was never going back to Elf because Elf became non-existent anymore. You know, and but that that's basically the reason that I left. And I worked. I went to work for. Um, you know, I worked as a as a carpenter for a couple of months. I learned that. I worked with a mason for a couple of months. I learned that. I worked with the, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation because I really love the outdoors. I did that for like two whole summers. You know, and I learned a lot of different things, and then I finally realized that, like, geez, you know, uh, I don't want to be a, par- a carpenter or, you know, or a mason or work for the conservation. You know, what what do I need? I got to make some money. I got to make a living. You know, so what what can I do that I can do the best and and make money at? And that's be a musician. And that's how I formed the Rods. And that's a segue well, into that, the Rods, right? Yeah, but but at that point, you know, Elf was already a, a done, a gone, you know, because it was already Rainbow, yeah. you know, it was already, you know, Elf was no more, so there was no there was no going back at that point, 
to, you know, what there was. Um, it was only going to something different that was that ended up to be the rods. And the rods, I formed the rods only because, only to like, it wasn't like I want to form the rods and make records and go on tour and do that whole thing. I only formed the band because I needed to make some money to live. <laughs> and I thought if I, if, I, if I formed a band, I could go out and play bars, you know, and I could make 50 bucks a night or whatever. You know, and uh, and I could live on that, and that's that's the only reason that band was formed was because of that. And I went to see Carl. Um, Carl was playing in a band called Colacus at the time, and I went to see him play, and I thought, oh, what a great drummer! And I talked to him about starting a band, and he said, yeah. And then, of course, we went through a couple different bass players before Gary entered the, the picture. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm starting to write songs. Carl's writing songs. You know, we get this guy that's interested that wants to be our manager. And pretty soon we're making records and we're on tour in England. So you know, let me ask you. Like, okay, so now you're on tour with England, right? Were you uh -huh. on the Aussie tour on the Blizzard of Oz tour in England or in the U.S.? We played with him in the U.S. Okay, so that's with Randy Rhodes in the yep. U.S. Not not the Blizzard yep. of Oz version of Ozzy, right? And what a great band that was. That was an awesome band. You know? Oh yeah. How many how many dates did you do with Ozzy? When, I'm not sure, you know, they were like spot dates, you know, we do one or two here and then one or two there, and um, but it wasn't like a solid tour, it was like spot, you know, spots, so it was a few dates, you know, but that band was, was an awesome band, and um, I remember, like, the sound check when the band played, you know, how, they're all great players, and the thing with Randy Rhodes is, is like, such a phenomenal guitarist, but what you hear on record is only the tip of the iceberg is what he was capable of doing because when you heard him warm up backstage, it was unbelievable what he was playing. I mean, it was just incredible. I, I had never heard anything like that in my life. I mean, it sounded, I just can't explain it, you know. So, I mean, if he had been, if he had not died, you know, all this would have come out. All the greatness and everything that, you know, he was capable of playing eventually would have been heard. <clears throat> but, like I said, what you hear on Ozzy's record is only the tip of the iceberg of what he could play. He was an amazing guitarist. Did you get you know, on the, 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 Did you talk to him in oh, person? Yeah. Oh yeah. Did you guys hang yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, he lent us one of his guitar straps because I think Gary lost or so <clears throat> lost a guitar strap or something, and uh, and and Randy gave him here. Take this one. You know, it was like sort of regular Fender strap, but um, I'm not even sure if Gary still has that strap or not. But anyways. Uh, yeah, no, they were they were great. You know, they were all great guys. You know, and great players. And Ozzy and I remember um, when Ozzy went on, everybody backstage had to like get in their dressing room. Like in other words, they wanted the whole backstage area cleared <clears throat> when it was time for them to go on stage. So we'd have to we'd have to get in our dressing room. But once they got on stage, we to take a drink. Um, we could you know we could go out and we could. Um, we could watch them, you know, from the side, but they wouldn't let anybody on the wings of the stage. You know what I'm talking about? We'd oh. stay down, and Sharon would be up on on the side of the stage, you know, and she'd look down at me, and she'd flag me up, and she'd come on up, you know, and I would stand, and I would watch the show with her. Oh. And, and, you know, we'd say, like, two words because you couldn't talk. <laughs> and I said, thank you, and, you know, I'd leave, and, you know, and I'm thinking, like, I always wondered, like, why did she ask me to come up on stage, <laughs> you know? And I think maybe she knew my association with Ronnie and uh, it was just being a polite thing for her to do, but I, I really appreciated it because I got to be on stage and watch the show. That's but yeah, those were, those were some good, good shows too. You know? So you probably yeah, did I mean, the Aussie thing first. I don't, uh, you probably know better than me. I'm just guessing on the dates here. I just... Well, the dates, you know, I can't remember the dates that, that much, but I know we did, we were in England for like, I think three months because we, we recorded from we recorded Wild Dogs there, mm -hmm. and then we went on tour for a month with uh, Maiden, and then we were there another month mixing uh, the album. So and then we came home. But when we came home, we did like um, a bunch of Judas Priest dates so, down in Texas. So you're with Iron Maiden, right? And this is you're talking about mm -hmm. the Number of the Beast, right? Bruce Dickinson's in the band. That's mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. the Number of the Beast. Yeah. What was the fan yeah. reaction, you know, to Number of the Beast? Bruce being in the band. I mean, Paul Diano was just in the band. He's not in the band anymore. Uh, what, what was the crowd reaction to you guys opening and to Iron Maiden in general? Well, first of all, the crowd reaction was great, you know, for us and Iron Maiden, you know. 
<clears throat> they loved it. And Iron Maiden had a great show with with Eddie, you know, the Beast walking around and um yeah, it was a great response. It were all good shows, you know, and we got great reviews. You know, like the next morning, we'd always look for the reviews in the papers and stuff, and um, and and the uh, everybody, they and us both got great reviews. It was a good, it was a good, uh, it was a very good momentum for us, you know, for the Rods because you know our our first album was out and it was doing really well, and it, and and that tour really, really gave us a lot of momentum. Okay, and then you come to the U.S. and you tour with Judas Priest. Yeah. Oh my God, you you guys have like <laughs> this is like the ultimate tours. So was it Screaming <laughs> for Vengeance? I guess it was Screaming for Vengeance yeah. back then, right? It was Screaming for Vengeance. Unbelievable. I mean, what was that experience and, like? Oh, that was awesome too because you know, um, again, fans of Judas Priest and the thing is, like Priest was very big. You know, they were doing big halls and they had a big stage set up. That's when they had that big aluminum like double. They had amplifiers up on top and the amplifier down on the bottom and the drummer was way up high and, you know, Rob came out with a motorcycle. It was a, it was a big, big show. And those guys are some of the nicest guys. And Rob Helford is probably one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. You know, you know he's truly the metal god, you know. I mean, there's nobody. Of course, of course. Uh, you know, his his presence on stage as being a metal, the metal god, I mean, Who's gonna Who's gonna outdo that? Nobody. You know? <laughs> Not, nobody is. You know, but he's really a sweet, <laughs> a sweet guy. You know, he's really a great guy, um, nice guy. And all the guys were. You know, KK Downing, Glenn Tipton, they're all really nice guys. It was It was It was a great experience to be on tour with them. And And, and here's another one, a little tidbit. You actually Metallica opened up for the Rods. And when was this? Oh, uh, this had to be. Probably 83, before, I would think. I don't know. I think it might have been, I'm not sure if it was before all this or after that, some of that stuff, because it was, at, I think it was a club called L'Amour. Yeah, New York, um, yeah. In New York. I don't, I don't know. I think we did two shows with, with Metallica opening up. Um, I can't remember. And I remember them being a great young band, you know, kids being a young band, being really good, you know. And again, uh, that was, quite an experience and of course they, you know look at their history you know I, I would uh, guess it was 83 84 around that era yeah you probably yeah you're probably right yeah yeah all right so i mean i know also there's a documentary on dio have you uh, wendy told me that they've started filming already geezer butler already uh-huh. did his part are you going to be participating in this yeah i already did um they interviewed me oh god years ago like uh, even a, a year or two after ronnie died um, they, Wendy came to Cortland with, um, you know, some, um, people that were filming and stuff. When we went, I drove him around, I showed him like where, where Ronnie used to live and where he went to school and, you know, different sites around DO way and the whole thing. And then I did an interview with them and uh, I think Mickey Lee did an interview and a, a good friend of ours and big fan of Ronnie's, um, Ron Ray in Syracuse did a, did an interview, but I know Wendy's going to do some more current interviews. Uh, with me because I just you know I just saw her in New York when we were down there for the hologram so yeah she she's working on that and that that's going to be great because she'll be talking they'll be interviewing everybody nice. you know everybody that's that's alive that's had anything to do with Ronnie or played with him or had anything to do with him you know will be in this documentary so it should be it should be really great yeah I'm looking forward to that too yeah. uh, and Ronnie's lyrics. When, when you sit and you listen to Ronnie's lyrics, and you know today yeah. you see you get emotional, does it bring back memories? Are you a part of his lyrics sometimes, or or a family, or you know that he was speaking to someone? Oh. Yes, I can, Yeah, and in fact, I was just talking to. Um, I did an interview actually, uh, one of the shows. I can't remember which one in New York. Somebody interviewed me and asked <clears throat> a similar question about that, and and yeah, because. Uh, when I hear the lyrics, you know, I can, I can relate. I mean, you know, like any song you can, you can take the lyrics and you can relate them in sometimes in many different ways, you know, um, maybe ways that would suit your life, you know, or an experience that you had. But when I hear the lyrics, I, I, I hear things, you know, that really relate to, to his life and experiences that I know about, you know, and almost every lyric, every song is that way. Uh, and Ronnie, had, you know, he was a genius when it came to, to words, you know, he was an incredible uh, 
he had an incredible mind, you know, so he had a way of like saying things that was totally different, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, he off the subject a little bit, you know, I mean, I would go visit him and he would, we would watch TV and we would watch, uh, you know, reruns of, um, family feud. <laughs> and, you know, I would be bored out of my mind, but Ronnie loved him because, you know, they were asking questions, you know, all these questions and, uh, you know, and he would, you know, he would, it would challenge him to see if he knew the answers to these questions, you know? And I know that when he, when one of the contestants would get it wrong, you know, he would start swearing at him. Oh, you're stupid. You know, blah, 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 (laughs) that kind of thing. But, you know, and, and the, and with the other thing is like with, with his vocabulary, you know, like when I would go visit him, um, you know, he would do crossword puzzles like every day he would get the paper and, and it was a ritual, you know, and, and nothing really, we didn't do anything until the crossword puzzles were done. And, you know, <laughs> as, as the week, as the week went on, you know, the crossword puzzles got harder and harder, you know, and, and bigger and bigger. So, um, you know, it, it was a challenge. So that's why I think that his vocabulary and his way with words he was such a genius is because he was so interested and so smart about, you know, things. And, um, and that that's what you know a lot of his lyrics relate to and and the last oh. question is his voice is it basically from blowing or pacing himself while he was breathing playing the trumpet that he de- developed the way to breathe and to sing properly i i don't know you know i know that you know like like i said he was a trumpet player so there's a certain way you breathe when you play trumpet you know you you're not you're not you know cuz i played trumpet too and it's like you're not supposed to breathe from your from your throat or your mouth when you're blowing the horn. You, you you do that from your diaphragm, you know. And I think that, you know, he might have learned that and, and helping him sing. I don't know. I mean, I think the guy was just a natural. I mean, yeah. he, he's, he was gifted, you know, with that voice. And, um, and that's just it. And the thing is, you know, in recording, in recording sessions, you know how like you know okay do it again do it again do it again you know it wasn't quite do it again it wasn't that way with ronnie you know ronnie would go in and he would sing it perfectly the first time you know and the only time he would do another take is if he wanted to do another take and try something different you know it wasn't like oh you were a little flat on that note so we're going to do another one you know the engineer didn't tell ronnie when they were going to do another one. Ronnie told the engineer <laughs> when they would do another one. And that's, that's basically the way it was. And the engineers learned that right away. <laughs> you know, yeah, like the first yeah, five yeah. minutes, the first five minutes he was in the vocal booth, you know, you know, you know, you know, nobody's telling Ronnie that you got to do another one, you know? So if you do another take, if you want to try something different, but he sang him perfectly every time, you know, he was just, um, just gifted, you know, just gifted and incredible. The and I, brother, and, you know, like, go, sorry, go ahead. Ron, Ron, Ronnie could have been, he could have been another Tom Jones or an Engelbert Humperdinck. You know, he his voice was capable of singing those songs. He did sing those type of songs. So he could have gone like the crooner route. He could have been a solo singer, been a Tom Jones, sang those kind of songs. Or he could have went, you know, any way he wanted, and he chose to go the rock and roll way, you know. But... um he could have he could have done anything. His voice was so versatile, and he could pull it off. That you know he could have gone any route that he wanted. You've become like the default ambassador of Ronnie in a way, right? Sort of like holding well, on kind to his of legacy. Because, yeah, be, kind of because you know I'm one of the only ones left. You know that that really have any kind of like history. Yeah. You know yeah. that that can talk about the years that are you know, the older years. You know, I mean Nikki Nikki the other guitar player is gone. You know. Um, Doug had a little bit of an association with us for a while, you know, but he didn't go way back. So, yeah, I, I guess so. You know, and the thing is I could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, one thing leads into another, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't and, want to take and, all your time. you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. And I, and I, the thing is I enjoy talking about it. You know, I enjoy talking about it because the people that ask me these questions want to know, you know, <clears throat> they, they want to hear what I'm saying, you know. So it's like, it makes me feel good because I enjoy saying it, and it, and uh, and it, hopefully it makes the people feel good because they get to hear it, you know. They get to hear things about Ronnie that, you know, they might not have known otherwise, you know. We're preserving his who, legacy. We're who knew, preserving it, right? You know, who, yeah. Who knew that Ronnie did crossword puzzles? There I mean, you go. 
Not me. I just you know, found I mean, out today. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. I mean, you know, those kind of things. So, um, anyways, uh, yeah, I, I love, I love talking about it. So there we go. The Rods. Let's not forget about the Rods. Brotherhood of Metal was released on June the seventh on uh, Steam Hammer SPV. Go out and pick it up. A must. I think it's probably one of my favorite albums this year. Uh, I just love it. It's melodic, it's catchy, it's anthemic. I love your vocals too. You know, a lot of people might say, well, he's not one of those screamers, but you know what? They're laid back. They're laid back. And that's okay because yeah. you, you and me come from a generation where you don't always have to scream. Yeah. You don't always no, have to I scream. No, I know. I know. So, <laughs> Thank you for being anyway, on the show. Oh, God. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. I, I, anytime, you know. Like I said, um, I could talk for hours. 